This is going to be the first lecture over chapter 28. We're going to be looking at photons, electrons, and atoms, not just the basic ideas that we've come to know from, say, uh, first chapter in physics or chemistry, perhaps, but we're actually going to be looking at some of the more modern activity that we see with these types of particles. So uh, here we go. Um, Photoelectric effect. So the energy of an individual photon is proportional to its frequency, which is not that much of a surprise for us. H is going to be considered to be Planck's constant. The wavelength of a photon, of course, is going to be given by this, where if you take the wavelength and you multiply it by the frequency, you actually get the speed of light. Um, so if you want just the wavelength by itself, you divide uh, both sides there by the frequency, and this is the equation you end up with. The momentum is going to be inversely proportional to the wavelength. So if you say that the momentum is going to be equal to the energy divided by the speed of light, energy is defined as this, and then you go through and you replace C with uh, this arrangement over here, and then you find out that you take uh, a Planck's constant divided by the wavelength, and that ends up getting So with the electric effect, which is what we'll be looking at, when striking a conductor is absorbed by an electron. And if the photon energy is greater than the work function of the material, the electron can escape from the surface. So this is a uh, picture of what we will be uh, looking at here. And uh, keep in mind, this is the galvanometer. This measures the current as it comes through. This is going to be a resistor. It's going to be the potential difference. So let's take a look at the chapter itself and see what it has to tell us. Okay, so it's first observed by Hertz in 1887, and the photoelectric effect is the emission of electrons from the surface of a conductor when light strikes it. So the liberated electrons absorb energy from the incident radiation, in other words, that's our power source, and are able to overcome the potential difference barrier that normally confines them inside the material. In other words, uh, electrons are bound to an atom. And there's a certain potential difference that needs to be compensated for. Well, the incoming photons uh, provide the means by which they can escape or overcome that potential difference. So the process is analogous to thermionic emission, discovered in 1883 by Edison, in which the escape energy is supplied by heating material to a high temperature, liberating electrons by a process analogous to boiling liquid. The minimum amount of energy an, elect an individual electron has to gain in order to escape from a particular surface is called the work function. So in other words, the work function is going to be that, um, that potential difference. That that's what's required in order for you to escape that particular surface. Thermionic emission, basically you just heat the, uh, heat the material up and then the electrons have enough to escape. Uh, the photoelectric effect uh, basically means that you're taking energy not from uh, a heat source per se, but you're taking it from sunlight or some other type of light shining on an object. So the photoelectric effect was investigated by uh, Wilhelm Hallwax and Philip Leonard during the years of 1886 to 1900. These two researchers used an apparatus that's going to be shown here. So you've got two conducting electrodes, uh, and they're enclosed in an evacuated tube, um, a glass tube. The negatively charged electrode is called the cathode, uh, cathode ray tubes you might remember from the old uh, TVs that uh, are now populating uh, 
the dumps across the nation. Um, and the positively charged electrode is going to be called the anode. So the battery or other source of potential difference creates an electric field, which you're seeing here in the arrows, in the direction from the anode to the cathode. Monochromatic single frequency light, or these purple arrows, fall on the surface of the cathode, causing electrons to be emitted. And a high vacuum with a certain residual pressure is needed to avoid collisions of electrons with gas molecules. So monochromatic light comes in, it's going to uh, strike the cathode. The electrons are pushed towards the electric field uh, or towards the anode by the electric field force. So the light comes in, the electrons are liberated, and because there's an electric field there that's going to be pushing these uh, here towards the anode, uh, that's what you see. Uh, when that happens, the current there is created. So the phototube uh, that we have here has a stopping potential V naught, and that's the minimum absolute value of the reverse potential difference that gives zero current. So in other words, there's some potential difference that you can apply there in order to be able to uh, stop the current. And that, that's, that's what it's talking about here. So once emitted, the electrons get pushed towards uh, the anode, causes a current in the external circuit, which is what you're seeing here. Uh, the current is measured by the galvanometer. And Hall, Walks, and Leonard studied how this current varies with voltage and with the frequency and intensity of light. What they found was that when monochromatic light falls in the cathode, no electrons are emitted unless the frequency of the light is greater than some minimum value called the threshold frequency. And that depends on the material of the cathode. So for most metals, the frequency corresponds to that of the light in the ultraviolet range. However, for potassium or cesium oxides, it is going to be in the visible spectrum. This experiment result is consistent with the idea that each liberated electron absorbs an amount of energy proportional to the frequency of the light. When the frequency is not great enough, then the energy is not great enough for the electrons to mount the potential energy barrier or the work function of the surface, and so you don't see anything. So when F is greater than the threshold value, some electrons are emitted from the cathode with substantial initial speeds. Um, so the evidence uh, is that even with no potential difference between the anode and the cathode, a few electrons actually do reach the anode, causing a small current in the, electric, in the external circuit. Indeed, even when the polarity of the potential difference is reversed and the associated electric field on the electrons is pushed back towards the cathode, some electrons still actually get there. So you, the electron flow stops completely only when the reverse potential difference is made large enough that the corresponding potential energy is greater than the maximum kinetic energy of the electrons. So in other words, you have to apply enough uh, energy or potential difference to make the potential energy such that it overcomes any sort of maximum kinetic energy. So, uh, measuring the stopping potential therefore gives us direct uh, measurement of the maximum kinetic energy electrons have on the leave cathode. So a classical wave theory of light would predict that when we increase the intensity of the light striking the cathode, the electrons should come off with greater energy and the stopping potential should end up being greater. That's not what you see. Um, this here, uh, shows how the potential or the photocurrent varies for with voltage for two different intensity levels. So when the potential of the anode with respect to the cathode is sufficiently large and positive, current levels off, showing that all of the emitted electrons are being collected by the anode. When the light intensity is increased, say from I to 2I, the maximum current increases, but the stopping potential is found to be the same. But when the frequency of the light is increased, the stopping potential increases linearly. Uh, these results suggest that the maximum kinetic energy of the emitted electron does not depend on the intensity of the light, 
but it does depend on the frequency of the wave. So the energy of an individual photon is equal to a constant times the frequency of the photon. And that's called Planck's constant. Uh, the stopping potential here, um, again, if we're looking at the maximum, it's, uh, yeah. it follows that the maximum kinetic energy from the emitted electron is the energy it gains by absorbing the photon minus the work function. So in other words, the maximum here is going to be whatever the energy you're getting minus whatever you have to pay in order to be able to bring the bond. So when you go through, you say, this is going to be equal to some sort of uh, potential energy given by the voltage. And then you can go through and find, uh, find out what that voltage is. So you've got several different uh, uh, work functions here for several different types of materials. So you've got several problems there that you can talk about that. Um, So you can see here the comparison of photographs made with a few and uh, many photons, what the difference is. Um, here you have the definition of energy for photons. Here you have the definition of uh, momentum and how that relates to the energy. So uh, those are all important, uh, important concepts to remember.